It's not a story that, that's told very often. They don't want to hear, for example, about former colonial peoples standing up against the oil industry, which is really a form of neo-imperial exploitation. They don't want to hear that. You're listening to Climate Curious, a podcast for people who care about the world but find the current conversation about climate change confusing, boring or scary. My name is Marian Pasha and I'm the director and curator at Telex London and co-host of this podcast, along with the amazing Ben Hurst. Say hello, Ben. Hey there, friends. I'm Ben Hurst, activist and advocate exploring what positive masculinities can look like, humble model and climate normie. Ben, this week, we are going to do things a little bit differently. Do you know sometimes when you meet someone and their story just floors you? Like, you know, you just can't stop telling everyone else you meet about this incredible person and Mm. the work that they're doing or whatever it is. Like, you've had that experience, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this week's guest is that person for me. Okay. So it's like you've met a main character. (laughs) Yeah, it's like I've met a main character and (laughs) I need everyone else to also know who this main character is that is such a great way of putting it (laughs) i'm definitely going to use that again so basically i heard this story doing some work i was doing earlier this year and i basically thought everyone needs to know so we've been talking a lot about intersectionality right um and it felt like if we're going to truly talk about intersectionality which for me sometimes also means like solidarity Mm. we should look at an international perspective Right, yeah, because we've been doing a lot of talking about intersectionality in London, <laughs> right? Rather than rather than maybe like the global picture of what that looks like, and and I think that yeah. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker, and maybe it will make sense to you. Melinda Janke is an international lawyer with over thirty years of experience. She has worked for companies and governments, uh, everyone you could imagine. But right now, she is leading the fight against dangerous deep water petroleum production in offshore Guyana. Now, basically, Ben, what we're talking about here is a fight against a massive corporation. It's like classic, classic, everything you've seen in the movies, but in real life. And the thing is, is that she is doing amazing work. She is winning. And this fight isn't just fight Guyana. It's for all of us. So I kind of not want to tell you very much more than that other than to tell you that in addition to all of that amazing work she's also does loads of human rights work so she's also worked in like you know independence movements working in the lgbt community working against the death penalty and i think it's going to be pretty epic okay then well let's dive into it welcome melinda thank you so much for joining us i didn't know very much about the situation that you work on until I met you. And so I was wondering if you could just tell us a bit about Guyana and what's going on there. I'd love to. And um, yeah, I'm very excited to be on this podcast. Um, maybe I could tell you a little bit about Guyana first, because it's a it's a really special place. Um, it's one of the few carbon sinks on the, on the planet. It's got more than 80% forest from the coast with the mangroves right into the interior, which is actually part of the Amazon forest. You hear a lot about the Brazilian Amazon forest. You don't hear so much, so much about Guyana. And it's in something called the Amazon Orinoco influence zone, which is a really special bit of the planet. Um, it's the longest mud coastline on earth. You can, you can go all over the world. You can get these beautiful sandy beaches, not here. We have mud and it sustains this incredibly rich marine life. And unfortunately for us, in 2015, ExxonMobil announced that they had found oil. The oil is about two miles below the seabed. So this is very, very deep and dangerous drilling at a time when the earth, when the world is moving away from fossil fuels and in a country that has no experience of oil whatsoever, no infrastructure, no expertise, no personnel, no idea what oil means. 
I, can I ask two questions just straight off the bat, right? Because I my one goal in this podcast is to never pretend that I know what <laughs> someone's talking about when I don't know what they're talking about. So what is, first of all, a carbon sink? Is that like, I'm not even going to try and guess. Can you just tell me <laughs> what is a carbon sink? Oh, yes. So if you look at the greenhouse gas emissions um, from the population of Guyana, every all the greenhouse gases that we emit are reabsorbed by our forest. Oh, and right. the forests are also taking out other greenhouse gases. So our forests right. are helping the rest of the world to breathe. We're taking out some of the greenhouse gas that you're putting up into the atmosphere right now. We're really climate right. heroes, you know. So you're, you're one of the good guys. You're one of the only countries that's actually helping, helping the rest of the world. And then the other question I was going to ask was, how do people discover oil? Like, how do you, is, how can you not know that it's there and then just randomly find it? Is it that they're looking for oil all the time in loads of different places? Or why was it, was there a reason that Guyana wasn't on the map for looking for that as a resource? That's an excellent question. I think people have always known that there is oil there because Venezuela has these massive reserves of oil and Suriname has oil and Guyana is in between the two. And in 2002, the United States Geological Survey said there was a 95% chance of oil being there, not just any old oil, but a really big find. So we've known for about 20 years that this is, this is likely to happen. Um, the looking for the oil, though, two miles below the seabed, it's not that easy to find. And the ocean right. is a mile deep. Of course, they shouldn't be looking for it. This is not the time to be doing oil. Five years ago wasn't the time to be doing oil. So this is a this is a, a project that from the beginning is irrational and irresponsible. Basically, it's crazy. Right, because oil oil as an industry is on its way out. Right, like that's we're coming to the end of, or hopefully, fingers crossed, we're coming to the end of that time because it's not friendly to the environment. Yeah, I mean, you've put that very nicely. I would say that fossil fuels are killing the earth and therefore we don't have a choice. We have we have to stop them and go immediately into removing the excess greenhouse gas so the earth can start to breathe again. Can you talk us through cause it, why this is bad for Guyana specifically? Because I, I want us to zoom out soon, but I want us to talk about what why why this is a concern for you. Yeah, oil is bad for any country that has been a colony. There's no example of a country that has done well from oil, except possibly Norway. And Norway has made itself extremely rich, basically, by stealing um, people's future. Uh, the UK had uh, an oil bonanza, where's that money? The Netherlands gave us the Dutch disease. So when you look at oil, it's got this terrible history, and it's even worse when you get to countries that were once colonized. There's a very specific thing called the oil curse, which is much, much worse than the resource curse. Now, in the case of Guyana, you've got um, a deal that is absolutely financially disastrous for the country. Um, at the end of five years, so by 2025, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, IEFA, they say that Guyana will owe Exxon Mobil about five billion. So financially, it's a disaster. Economically, of course, it's a disaster because the government is trying to uh, pivot Guyana's economy and make it dependent on oil at a time when the IMF, the World Bank, the IDB, everybody globally is saying, move away from oil, move into renewable energy. Guyana's trying to do exactly the opposite. Environmentally, it's terrifying. N not only um, is this going to emit greenhouse gases, Exxon says they've discovered more than 9 billion barrels of oil. If that oil gets burnt, it's going to emit about 3.87 gigatons of greenhouse gases. So if... As someone who is really new to this, if we're understanding this correctly, you know, you've got this massive discovery of oil in one of the world's major carbon sinks. So the, the, one of the very few places that's actually trying to help us fight climate change. There's this been massive discovery of oil, which threatens 
the local livelihoods, which threatens the local environment and ecosystems, which could have d- disastrous impacts all around the region, right? Um, I guess my question is, because people are hearing about this for the first time, who are you? Right. And what are you doing? Because <laughs> this is like a terrifying story. But why, you know, tell us about you. Why are we speaking to you? And what's your, what's your role in this? So I'm a lawyer. I'm a okay. lawyer um, from Guyana, but I also grew up in, in England and in Zambia and in Trinidad. And um, I went to university at Oxford and London. So I have three law degrees. Three law degrees. Okay, sorry. Let's not make a big deal out of it. That's a lot of law degrees. <laughs> okay. Right, law. Yeah. And, and you have, from from finding out more about you, you've done something pretty special for the constitution of Guyana, right? Let, let's talk about these foundation bits first. Sure. So in, um, in 2002, 2003, Guyana went through a constitution reform exercise and I lobbied very hard to put into the constitution a right to a healthy environment. And in the end, the um, that the committee that was looking at this, I think they got so fed up with me that they just wrote back and said, yes, we'll put it in. And so we, we have this marvelous um, article in the constitution, article 149J, which is the right to a healthy environment and which um, protects the rights of present and future generations. And is that unusual? Like, are there other constitutions in the world that have that right? Yeah, absolutely. This one um, is really modelled on the South African constitution, and increasingly countries are putting a right to a healthy environment into the into the constitution. Twenty years ago, I would say we were in among the the early the earlier batch. Uh, I think the UK, of course, doesn't have a written legal constitution and therefore doesn't have a right to a healthy environment. So I think this is why litigants in England are really struggling to to make progress on climate change. The other thing we have in the constitution is is an article that I wrote, which basically says, the well-being for the nation depends on clean air, clean water, healthy ecosystems, rich biodiversity, and so on. Um, And that's a principle that the government the courts, the parliament, they all have to take into account in making decisions. So have you been doing this piece of work for 25 years? I've been doing doing work to protect Guyana for, for yeah, 25 years, since, since 1994 right. when, I, when I came back to Guyana. It's interesting to me, like, that we, we understand your motivation so easily now because we know you're from there. And yet you told us over and over again, just already in this conversation, how what is happening in Guyana can be a disaster for the whole world. Um, but because it's not here, we don't see it, we don't know about it, we don't care about it. You've been laying a foundation for 25 years that now you're able to use, right? And so I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about now how you're using that foundation in total layman's terms, how you're using that foundation to to take on, yeah, Ben is right, like a massive behemoth, right, of a, of a, of a company. Well, I was sort of hoping other people would have been using this over the last 25 years. <laughs> but, but we are where we are. Um, so, you, so using the legislation, um, when you look at what is going on, uh, one of the difficulties is to actually to get people to act because people are afraid. There is a there is there is a culture of fear in Guyana, and there's there's no there's no getting around that. So the, it took a while to to get the first case going, which was in in 2018, and that one's now in the court of appeal because the judge ruled against us, and of course we we don't agree with the judge's ruling with all with the greatest possible respect. So we have. Um, filed the appeal, we filed it within two days and that case, we're waiting for that case to come up. Uh, The second case was the one where um, we challenged Exxon's permit. So they were were granted for 23, 24 years, um, two of them, and we said, no, actually, you're only allowed to grant them for five years. And what happened was that we've got an order, which, which they consented to, reducing their permits to five years. 
So instead of the permits ending, the first one would have ended in 2040, it now ends next year, they've got to apply for a new permit. And that gives everybody in Guyana a chance now to come back and to use this Environmental Protection Act, which um, has very, very strong provisions in it for public participation. So when I worked on it, I put in these provisions that say you have to share all the information with people, you have to take into account what they say, they have to have access to everything that you put into your environmental impact assessment, um, and they're allowed to challenge your decision. So it's all it's all there. And then, of course, the one nobody wants to talk about in the region is rising sea level. Georgetown is below sea level. Most of it, most of Guyana's wealth is below sea level. The agriculture is below sea level. And we have a little wall that's about three feet high in places that's supposed to stop the Atlantic. <laughs> right. Exactly. Which is not going to work. It's yeah. not, it's not going to work. <laughs> Um, we had floods last last week, and I had fish outside my front door. Now, that's very charming, but it does tell you there's an awful lot of water where it's not supposed to be. This is what fossil fuels are doing to us directly. This is climate change. This is global warming. This is rising sea level. This is extreme weather. There's no getting away from it. And it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think I think when so my parents are, are both from the Caribbean. Whether this is factual or not, in my mind, the Caribbean is like the first place that's going to be really badly impacted by global uh, climate change. Um, like the the first islands that are going to disappear. That's really dangerous, right? In specifically in in the context of Guyana, because it is a carbon sink. So like, if we can't really afford to lose that country that is then like below sea level and, and prone to flooding and all of those kinds of things anyway um so is there a way is there a way of stopping this i think it's really interesting when you look at the caribbean because with the exception of trinidad which um has been doing gas for a long time the rest of the english speaking caribbean really um has not uh, is, is not responsible for climate change, but those countries are going to be among the first to suffer. And this is a recurring pattern with climate change that the people who have caused the problem um, are not really the ones that are bearing the brunt of it now. If you look at the Pacific Islands, you know, which are already um, becoming submerged, they've done really nothing to contribute to climate change but they're the ones that are beginning to suffer from now i'm so glad you're talking about this because i do think that the biggest one of the biggest changes i've had it in understanding climate change is to stop thinking about it as a future problem you know i th i do feel like this was always something that was looming on the horizon and now it's it's here. Okay, so we're sitting here in London. What is the link between maybe some of you know our viewers between me and Ben and you sitting in Guyana? How can we think about this um, if it isn't affecting us personally tomorrow? You know, what is the link that you see? I think it is affecting you already because England, Scotland, Wales, you're already getting uh, strange weather you're already getting in places extreme weather. It's the same planet. It's the same climate. It's the same system. So whatever we do has an impact on you, just as what you do has an, has an impact on us. Whatever happens in London now is affecting us here. What we do here affects, affects you in the UK. What you've chosen to do is essentially fight in a, what, from an outside of perspective seems like an unwinnable battle, but from everything that you say, you are a hundred percent confident that that there is no other option but winning, which I love, by the way. And I and I just I I wish I could live in this world where I kind of did not accept the alternative. I just want to find out what is it like personally for you to do this, you know, take on this fight. Well, I wouldn't say it was comfortable. 
Um, it's quite difficult at times. This is a country in which people are very frightened. There's a culture of fear. People don't speak out. There's a culture of fear mongering. So if you do speak out, other people tell you that you shouldn't do it. Um, so it's a difficult environment. And then in addition to that, there's a lot of external pressure to do to do this oil. So the World Bank is pushing Guyana to do the oil. The IDB is pushing Guyana to do the oil. That's in addition to the commercial companies that want Guyana to do oil. Uh, we've had Global Witness, a British NGO, publish a report um, in which they lied incidentally and said that Guyana would get 168 billion US dollars from the oil. Um, people said to me, but you're standing in the way of Guyana getting 168 billion US dollars. That's not a good place to be, and that's not a good thing to hear. And in the end, um, you know, enough people mobilized and forced Global Witness to withdraw that report. But that kind of thing um, doesn't help at all and is very, very irresponsible. And, and they were told not to do it even before they did it. So, yes, it's difficult and it's uncomfortable. But, you know, life is full of things that are difficult and uncomfortable. Like that's like a really, really important message, right? Like that sometimes there are things that you have to stand up for and there are things that you have to do that are like not necessarily fun or not very easy, um, but they really have to be done. Um, and I, I, I kind of wonder like where you, where you go next. I think that's a really good question. And it's an, it's an ongoing um, thinking through because I don't have the answers. I don't think anybody does have the answers. And I don't want you to think now that I'm just doing this all by myself because I do have um, other people who are absolutely critical. You know, um, after we, we started one of the cases, Carol Muffet from the Center for International Environmental Law called me one day and said, you know, they were interested in this work and they, their support and their advice and their help has really been fantastic um, and invaluable. And they are extremely well connected also to the global climate movement, which we are we are sort of airbrushed out of. Right. If you look, Guyana is a carbon sink and is uh, technically a climate leader, but is portrayed as this developing country that needs to catch up with the developed world that has destroyed the climate. So we're always portrayed as somehow not quite there needing to catch up. Actually, it's the other way around. If you pivot and you look at where the earth should be going, we're out in front. Except, except for the pressure to do this crazy oil drilling at a time when even the International Energy Agency has said no new fossil fuels. No new fossil fuels. So we've gone probably overnight from being the population with the highest wealth per capita in terms of oil, in terms of barrels of oil, which is the way, you know, the pro oil people like to describe it, to being the country with the highest per capita of stranded fossil fuel assets because the market has changed. I think even like that framing is really important because I think in, in my mind or when we have these kinds of conversations what people often say is like what they hope for for the future is that uh where they are will change so much that they can become a, a leader in what is about but it sounds like <laughs> you're in a place where that's already happening right where where you're already leading that kind of march um but we have to stop the oil or it won't it won't work yeah. <laughs> We'll stop. We'll be a carbon bomb instead of a carbon sink unless yeah. people wake up to what's happening. Right. You know, we've done a few episodes now on looking at the intersectionality of climate change, what it has to do with race. Um, and we, we've talked about other countries, but we've looked very much at it within like a Western context. And for me, what really resonates here is we're looking at, you know, black and brown people in another part of the world that we that these communities often who have the least to do with creating the problem are now the ones who are at the forefront of experiencing like the harm, um, whether it's air pollution or as you said, flooding and loss of livelihood. So for me, it's just been this really 
important connection between understanding, I guess this is what global solidarity is, right? Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right because um, in the so-called rich countries, the ones that are, haven't got much biodiversity left but have got massive material assets, the disparity um, between rich and poor means that generally, I'm not everywhere, but generally you can say that people of color are the ones that bear the brunt of environmental damage. And particularly now, the impacts of fossil fuels, including the the toxic air, um, as well as global global warming and um, you know rising sea level and so on. So within the rich countries, there is this divide already. And then there is a global divide between the countries that are materially rich and have built their economies on fossil fuels and the countries that have not built their economies on fossil fuels and who are still fairly rich in biodiversity and are now bearing the brunt of the impact of those fossil fuel economies. It's not a story that um, that's told very often. Um, when you look at the international media, the portrayal of countries that are rich in biodiversity, former colonies, is these poor countries. Um, they're all victims, they're weak, they're incompetent, they're corrupt. And when you fight back, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear, for example, about former colonial peoples standing up against the oil industry, which is really a form of neo-imperial exploitation. They don't want to hear that. The fight against oil in Guyana barely, barely breaks it through the surface. It's not, it doesn't fit with what people want to hear, or at least it doesn't fit with the the interests of international media in general. I mean, there are exceptions and there's some, you know, there's some fantastic, brilliant journalists out here who are going, who are telling the story. But it does generally, um, that's not the message that goes out, that we are fighting back against oil and standing up to one of the biggest companies in the world and its two partners and a government and the World Bank and the IDB and the IMF and all the vested interests that go, that go with that. And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. Okay, so we've reached Climate Confessions, which is the part of the episode um, where we invite our wonderful guests uh, to share something about themselves and about their climate action that maybe they're not doing so well. <laughs> Linda, you guys can't see this if you're listening, but Melinda's got her head in her hands right now. <laughs> I love so. that. that. I love how week after week we invite like the most amazing, like, you know, Melinda, you haven't flinched once in t- talking about all. taking on ExxonMobil, but we come to Climate Confessions and everyone just, no. No. just gets so nervous. <laughs> I have got a climate confession. I'm slightly worried that this is going to be one of the worst climate confessions ever. And it is that I actually started off a good chunk of my career in the oil industry. (gasps) Oh, I'm so sorry that I got... I don't... (laughs) (laughs) Really? Oh, I no. don't mean okay, that I on. just worked for a firm that um, that gave advice to the oil companies. I mean, I worked in the head office of an oil company. I actually worked in the head office of British Petroleum in London. But, you know, don't you... I am sure I have at least seen two movies based on true stories where the lawyer that takes down the company first started by working right, for right. that company. <laughs> yeah. I think I've definitely seen two movies about this. You've seen it, the machinery from the inside. Maybe that is part of where your kind of unwavering confidence comes from. I love it. I certainly think it's important to know the industry that you are dealing with. But that's kind of a, a weak sort of thing to say. It's there. The climate confession is there. There's no going back. 
Well, I don't know if I can top that confession or even come close to it in any way. Ben, have you thought of one for this week? I, I actually have thought of one. Um, and I my one is definitely not as bad as yours, Melinda. No, I'm joking. I have been using this summer um, ice from bags. And I, I said in, in last week's episode that I wasn't sure... Um, where I was doing stuff that that was like going to be bad but I I've, I've done a little bit of research and I've realized that packaging is like one of the big areas in my life that I'm probably failing in miserably and I can actually just freeze water in, in the freezer instead of buying <laughs> buying ice in plastic bags and then throwing away the plastic bags um so that's something that I've decided that I'm going to commit to trying to change um because it's just so much more convenient do you know what I mean like to have a a big bag of ice when you need ice rather than having to think about freezing water what a massive inconvenience see i'm going to tell you something and i and i cannot believe that i've actually had this thought because melinda must be like what is wrong with them but what i do because i also had in the u.s this like love of bagged ice and then realized how ridiculous it is um is I have a little like box, like a little paper box in my fridge. Yeah. And I, and whenever I freeze ice and I go to take out like one ice cube or two ice cubes, I empty the rest of it into the box. Right. And so then you're I saving. so so I have a little mini box of ice in yeah. my fridge. That's a good That's idea. The, uh, the genius. Yeah. I, I think feel like what we've done, Ben, is we've taken what was a really important conversation <laughs> yeah. and a really major climate confession and just just changed the tone. You know, well, I think all of the conversations are equally important because we've given people solutions for global climate crisis and for freezing water <laughs> to make ice cubes and having excess of ice in your freezer so you're welcome everyone no problem <laughs> i think that's brilliant because actually it's not all about being serious it's about the day-to-day stuff that we do right okay i would like to wrap up by just saying a huge thank you to you melinda sometimes it feels like you need someone out there reminding us that we can we can do what seems undoable so i just want to say thank you for for uh sharing all of your experience with us Thank you. I mean, I'm I'm so thrilled that you've had me on the program. I suppose one of the things that I think about is the, the poet Rumi. He said, you're not a drop in the ocean. You're the ocean in one drop. And that's all of us. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate, subscribe and share this episode with a curious friend. It makes us possible to keep making this amazing content for you. Oh, and slide into our DMs at TEDx London and let us know which climate extraordinaires you'd love to hear from next time. Oh, and don't leave yet. We wanted to tell you a bit more about who made this podcast possible. Yeah, we did. TEDx London's headline partner, City, has been supporting us for the past five years to bring world-changing ideas to the TEDx London stage. And now they're taking it to the next level by making this podcast possible. Thanks, City. But wait, that is not all. No, this podcast was produced by the amazing Josie Coulter. Curation and research by the genius Tara Cooper. Artwork designed by the visionaries that are Sabrina Russo and Rebecca Mingus. Mixed and engineered by the iconic Ben Beheshti, a.k.a. The Falcon, who also composed our banging theme tune. Presented by me, Marion Pasha. And by me, Ben Hurst. Stay curious.